Hi, Saints, and all the young people there in Hualien. My name is Stephen Lin. I'm a brother from the church in Houston in the state of Texas here in the United States. I'm so happy that you're able to join us uh, in the Summer School of Truth, which I believe we're going to have a great time learning and fellowshipping on this topic of the church. You know, the matter of the church is central to everything that God has planned and done in the past, continues to do today, as well as into the future. And all of you, including me and all your serving ones, are all part of God's great plan for the church. You know, this matter is so central and, and important that we can say that everything we have covered in the Summer School of Truth, whether it's on knowing God, knowing about the person and work of Christ, knowing about God's full salvation, and last year when we covered the matter of life, all are for the producing of the church. So why is this such an important topic? Well, it is because the church is something that is very dear to God's heart, and building up the church is something that is central to his plan and work, from eternity past to eternity future. So therefore, it is very important that we have a proper view of what the church is. You know, when maybe, maybe when, you, when I mentioned this word church, or maybe when you saw the topic of what the, the subject matter of this uh, Summer School of Truth is, you may have certain concept of what the church is, right? Many Christians have a concept of what the church is as well. You know, maybe you have a picture uh, that's a physical building uh, with four walls, a pointy roof, uh, maybe a stained glass. Uh, is that your picture of what the church is? Well, that's maybe that's a concept of a lot of people because that's where oftentimes people say, where is your church? Or what church do you go to? Right? Or many, however, some people do accept the fact that the church is indeed a group of people who believe in the Lord and they meet in different groups uh, because they have uh, different practices, such as some people uh, go to a Baptist church or go to a Methodist church, and some just go say they go to a non-denominational church. Uh, so do you think uh, a place or a group of people that meet together once a week, is that what God is after? Well, obviously not. So I hope that after the summer of school truth, you really see what the church is. So to see the church from God's perspective, we must have a vision of the church. Um, so this is the topic of this first message. So what is a vision? You know, a vision is more than just seeing something or knowing about something or understanding something. A vision could be an extraordinary view or a scene. It is really a special seeing of something that may not be so apparent to most people. You know, in business, when a president, president of a company say that he or she has a vision, typically it's a perspective that that person has to make the company successful or profitable. You know, we know for sure that someone with a vision don't stay in bed, right? A, a true visionary is always someone who's starting to action. You know, a person who is full of vision cannot sit still. They are stirred up into action and work very hard so that their vision could be realized. A person with a vision will also work very hard to try to persuade others to see their perspective so they can get everyone on board to adopt the same goal. Well, in this very same way, we all need to have a vision of the church. You know, such a vision should cause you to be stirred up. You know, if you have a vision of the church, we will touch God's eternal purpose. And once we touch God's heart, we wouldn't be able to stay, sit still. We will all be stirred up to action in order that God will accomplish his purpose in us. So on one hand, I you know vision should stir us up to action. But on the other hand, it should also cause restraint. So here is a, is a verse from Proverbs um, 29, 18. It says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. So not only your vision should stir you up towards an action, but it also should restrain you from doing certain things so that you will not deviate from reaching the goal of the church. So once we have a vision of the church, we should be stirred up towards an action of what we should do in our lives, but also we to also be restricted from doing from everything that would distract us from that goal. So for, in order for us to have a vision of the church, we do need to start off by laying down some solid foundation of what the church is. There are several points in your outline and in the booklet uh, that I would like to go over now that cover some points on the vision of the church. But again, we're not here for mere knowledge, but each of these points should be really become our experience 
as well as our enjoyment. So for the first point, God's eternal purpose being the church. So sorry. You know, from Ephesians uh, 3, 9, it says, and to enlighten all that they may see what the economy of the mystery is, which throughout the ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So this is a, a mystery of God. This plan and economy of God has been hidden, but now all will be enlightened to see what that mystery is. And in Ephesians 3, 10 to the 11, in order that now, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenlies, the multifarious wisdom of God might be named, made known through the church according to the eternal purpose which he made in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what is, so that, so that means that God's heart's desire and plan was a mystery and that was hidden, but now it is revealed. Through what? It is revealed through the church according to his eternal purpose. You know, from eternity past, God's desire and plan was to have the church. You know, from the beginning in his creating man in Genesis 1, it says that God said, and God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. You know, Adam was placed in front of the tree of life. For what purpose? So that he would actually partake of God as his life. And of course, the tree of life was a symbol of, of God as divine life. So God created us in, for, with Adam as, as the first man with a purpose that man will be filled with, with his life. So that, that was the God, God's original intention that God will be filled with his life in order so that God will have a, a group of people that will be filled with his life. So that's really the church. So the second point, okay, the second point is, and I'm going to share my screen again, is that the church is not a physical building, but that the church is a building up of all God's chosen, redeemed, regenerated, and transformed people. And it's not a physical structure, like we said at the beginning. So the church is not only not a physical building, but it's actually a building of a group of people, of a special group of people who are chosen. That means they're chosen from eternity past. Des they're destined to be God's people because God has chosen them. However, there are also those, because of man's fall, they need to be redeemed. And Christ has died to redeem man and save them, save man in order that, that, that man will be reconciled back to God. But then, however, you still need to be, you need to believe first. And by you believing and, and through your baptism, you will be regenerated. That means you actually, another life has come into you. And that you'll be regenerated at the time that you believe. However, these people will also be transformed. Transformation is really a lifelong process after regeneration. And transformation is not an instant thing. It actually is something that's very gradual, right? It takes a time for transformation to occur. So while we say while we say that the church is not a physical building, it is a building nonetheless. However, instead of a building with physical materials like wood, steel, steel, or concrete, it is a corporate building of God's people. And these ones are chosen, redeemed, and regenerated, and transformed. So it means that you and I are the very building materials of the church. We can't even say. That is through the transforming work that God is doing in you every day that you're becoming more and more buildable into God's building. So the more you touch the Lord, the more the Lord is built into you and you go from your old human life, which is completely not buildable, to become the transformed materials for his building. You know, God's life transforms us to become the very materials for his building so that we can become the church. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, because the church is built together by God's redeemed, regenerated, and transformed people, the church becomes the living organism of God, which actually goes over, goes to the next slide. So the church, as an organism of God, must be full of life, right, as an organism, and is not an organization. So to see this point, 
we actually have to use our physical body as a picture. You see, your body is it an organism or organization? Well, obviously, you are an organism. You're not just composed of organized parts and just somehow fit together as a jigsaw puzzle. However, all your parts work together in perfect harmony because all the parts are linked by life. A church on the a chair, on the other hand, is an organization. It is composed of parts that are dead and do not function in harmony. You know, I have never had a chair that would complain when I accidentally break off a, a leg of the chair. But if you try to stump my toe, I'll complain a lot and my whole body will react to it because my whole my body is full of life and functions together to protect itself so that it can properly function and grow in life. Right? A chair certainly, the chair actually serves a purpose, but it receives no life and does not have life in itself and does not minister life. But because the church is a living organism of God, it is full of life and it is able to minister the divine life. You know, there are actually also many verses in the in the Bible that speaks on the church being an organism of God. You know, in Colossians 1.18, it says that he, which is Christ, is the head of the body of the church. In Colossians 1.24, I now rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf for his body, which is the church. So the church is the body of Christ. In Ephesians, it says, out from whom? All the body. So out from Christ, all the body being joined together and being knit together through every joint of the rich supply, through the air operation of each one part, a measure of each one part, causes the growth of the body onto the building up of itself in love. Ephesians 5.30, because we are members of his body. In Romans 12.55, it says, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And in, and in 1 Corinthians 12.12, it says, even as the body is one and has many members, yet all the members of the body, being many, are one body, so also is the Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we see that the church is composed of many members growing into the church, just like your physical body. As you eat, you grow. And as the organism of God, as the church, we also have to eat God as life in order for us to grow in life. So therefore, the essence, this is actually the fourth and fifth points, because you're an organism of God, the essence of the church is of life, is not of knowledge. And the fifth point is that the nature of the church, being of heaven, is not of earth. So for the, for the, first, for the fourth point is that the essence of the church is life. You know, it needs to be full of life, right? We, of course, are not talking about our human life, but this is, of course, referring to God's life. You know, God's life needs to first grow in each one of us, and then the church will grow in life. It is because as you grow in life, you will be full of life and will be able to minister life to others to help others grow in life. You know, we're not here just to learn about God or to have some knowledge of God. You know, knowledge only brings in death, right? Just by knowing about God as knowledge or studying the Bible in some academic way, or you have a great mind and are able to memorize the entire Bible, but if you don't come to the Lord first as life, not only will you die, but you will even cause death in others. It doesn't mean that we don't want you to read the, the Bible. Of course, we want you to read the Bible or even memorize the word. But we must first turn our mind to our spirit and touch the Lord in our spirit. Then we will receive the life supply. And we will have, of course, the word as life that will come into us as supplying as supply to us. Then we'll be able to actually feed others and feed, uh, feed, on, uh, feed others, uh, feed Christ to others as life. And only that way will the church be produced. You know, in, the fifth, in this fifth aspect, the nature of church being heaven, not of earth, it actually in, uh, you know, Paul in, in Colossians 3, 1 to 3, it says, if therefore you are raised together with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things which are above, not on the things which are on the earth. You know, we should realize that as the church, we are heavenly people and that we should not be distracted or bound by the earthly things. We should care only for the things of God's interest. You know, by us living in such a way, we will be the proper materials for God's building. 
So now go to the sixth point, is that the foundation of the church being Christ. You know, in Matthew 16, 15 to 18, it says, he said to them, but you, who do you say that I am? So this is actually Christ asking the disciples, who do people say that he is? His disciples respond to saying, you know, some say that you're a prophet, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist. But what did the Lord say? The Lord asked him, who do you say, who do you say that I am? And actually, and Simon Peter says that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And how did Jesus respond? Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in the heavens. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So it's really, from this verse, we can see is that only the revealed Christ and us seeing who Christ is, that will cause the church to be built in us. It's actually the appreciation of Christ that will cause us to experience and enjoy him in order for us to become the church. You know, how can we appreciate Christ? Well, we need to first open to him and spend time with him. As soon as we touch him, he will be so real to us and we will love him with all of our heart. And it's really through that revelation and that enjoyment of Christ that he, Christ will be able to build in us and, and build us up as the church. You know, in Ephesians uh, 2, 19 and 22, it says that you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom all the building being fitted together is growing into the holy temple of God, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in spirit. So the key word here is in whom you are growing into and that in whom you are being built together. So it is all Christ. Yeah, we need to not only see Christ from Matthew, right? The previous verses, but we also need to see Christ so that we can enjoy Christ and to know Christ and to be in Christ so that the church could be built together into the one church of God through Christ who built us together into the dwelling place of God in spirit, amen. So then what is the outcome of us enjoying Christ and growing into Christ? And that's the last point. The seventh point is that the church being glorious. You know, when we see Christ and eat Christ and enjoy Christ every day, what should the church be? The church should be glorious. What is glorious? What is glory? Glory is simply the expression of God. And this is really, this point, this, this verse really illustrates it well. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Right, It says that we as the church should be those with unveiled face, beholding and reflecting like a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord's spirit. This means that when people see us, people should not see Stephen or Frank or Mary or any, anything natural, but people should see God. As a church, we should be like reflections, like mirrors, reflecting God himself, because however, because we've been taking God, so therefore we eat, we only reflect and express what we eat. So if we eat God, we will express God. Amen. So to summarize, we need to see that the church is God's heart's desire. You know, it is not a physical building or, or an organization, but it's a living organism composed of God's believers that are filled and continue to be filled with his life so that Christ can be built can be built in us as the church. So how do we keep this vision? You know, how can we, how can this vision be real to us? Well, we need to pray to the Lord to help us see. We just ask you to be open to the Lord. Just touch him, call on his name, read his word, be with the brothers and sisters in the church, and most importantly, stay in the church life. You know, every day, be obedient to his speaking in you. The Lord will work in you, and the more and more you will start to see the true significance of the church. And once you see the vision of the church, your life will never be the same. You'll want to become the proper materials for God's building, and you will also begin to have God's heart for man 
with the same burden to bring others into Christ so that they can be also be part of the organism of God. So this is the vision we need to have for the church. You know, may the Lord enlighten you more and more and that your daily living will be affected by this vision. You know, through all, all the messages in the Summer School of Truth, we hope this vision will become clearer and clearer and that you will grow to appreciate more and more what the church is. This will not become mere knowledge, but it will become your experience and become real to you. And your heart for the church will match God's heart and for the church. If you see this, you will never be the same. God will be happy, very happy, and you will also be very happy because you love God and you know his, God, heart's, uh, his heart's desire. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I'll end here. I believe the brothers will tell us uh, how to break up into our uh, individual study groups. Amen.